It's another beautiful Sunday afternoon. This is Robin Minds. Welcome. My name is Ebuka Obuchi, and thanks a lot for joining us Nigeria today. We did celebrate um, Democracy Day um, during the week. Nigeria um, is 21 years post-democracy. Um, we did uh, <laughs> um, shift the date from May 29 to June 12 in commemoration of uh, uh, June 12, 1993, when uh, MKO Abiola was... Uh, duly elected as president of the country, but the election was annulled. So it's a, the first time I'm celebrating Democracy Day on a different day. Uh, we're going to be looking at Nigeria so far, especially with a focus on human rights and um, how much we have um, improved, hopefully, uh, in, in the last 21 years since democracy has returned. Um, there's a lot to unpack with that, and we're going to be joined by a lot, a lot of guests who have, um, over the years, proven themselves to be worthy of being on the show today. Let's take a look at this. All right, welcome back. Yes, we're going to kick off the conversation immediately. I'm joined now from Abuja by Dr. Sam Amadi, um, a lawyer and a consistent um, vocalist when it comes to Nigerian issues. Thanks a lot for joining us today, sir. Um, going straight into it, um, 21 years since uh, democracy in Nigeria. Um, a two-part question. First of all, how are we doing with regards to human rights um, since democracy returned? And of course, looking back at the way the military handled things. And secondly, if there's an improvement, are we where you think we should be at this point? Well, thank you very much. I think uh, first question, how we are doing with human rights, I think is uh, half cup, half, half empty, half full. Uh, I would like to say maybe half full. Um, first, we now have an institutionalized human rights framework. The National Human Rights Commission is now a national human rights. In the earlier days of the civil liberties organization, uh, human rights was not a national concern in terms of institutionalized government focus. We had uh, NGOs like the CLO and others doing it as against government. But today, uh, based on uh, existing international protocol and best practices across the world, Nigeria government uh, so, uh, you know, incorporated the National Human Rights Commission as the Niger nation's own human rights watchdog. So, in a sense, you can say some institutional uh, support for human rights. Again, we've seen also an um, increasing number of uh, human rights, diversification in human rights. We've, we've seen gender right based organizations. We've seen those who veer into public policy, like some of us did. I've seen those who are doing to development. So, you can see greater diversification in the institutional framework for dealing with human rights. But, but if you look at human rights, in terms of observation and observance, in terms of experience, what people have benefited, in terms of respect for these rights, I think you've not done very well. Today, we're talking about the rape being like more like a pandemic, uh, and uh, we, we, many states have refused to, to enact laws uh, like the Child Rights Act, uh, violence against women, and several other women equality rights laws. Uh, almost Most of the states have not done so. So essentially, we've not done well uh, on that area. Look at issues around freedom of press, which um, the Nigerian press has been very, very historic in terms of fighting for dem democracy and human rights. Even under the military, we were, it was such a great time for the press. Today, we see the press coming under greater and greater you know, onslaught, especially uh, bloggers and social media activists. We've seen people being arrested and, and on usual resort to terrorism charges against uh, indecent or uh, or inconvenient speech. So we, we've not done much in terms of really expanding the realization and the, and the enjoyment of these essential rights. We've done well in terms of the growth of uh, human rights advocacy, like I said, moved from a single, the political rights and the civic rights focus to um, now economic rights, to, to poverty issues, equality, uh, underrepresentation, gender, and so on. So it's a thriving uh, uh, sector, but in terms of government respect, for human rights in terms of the institutions like the police actually playing by the rule of fair policing, the rules against impunity. In, in, in the context of even the courts themselves, judiciary, enforcing these rights, we've not done very, very well. We've I'm very, that um, sorry, processes doctor. are still bad. Uh, we've not been able to, yeah. We've not sorry been able to, to cut you off there, because I'm very, very, I'm coherent very. coherent framework for dealing with bail, yeah. Yeah, sorry to cut you there. I'm very, very particular about the, the issue of journalism and you know the press, which you've talked about. The Nigeria continues to rank very poorly with regards to freedom of speech, uh, or press freedom, I beg your pardon. And um, 21 years down the line, I mean, we've had cases in the past where journalists were blown up in their homes, uh, media organizations were shut down. 
it looked like, you know, with democracy and the military gone, things like this would be a thing of the past. But like you've said, we still have this happening today where media personalities get missing. You know, journalists just disappear into thin air or get arrested for certain stories they publish. Why are we still there today? Well, I think partly because uh, we got into democracy without internalizing the values. I mean, it could be, we can call our democracy rushed democracy. I, I was a counselor with Chief Gadafa with me when we started the National Conscience Party, which was actually myself, Chief Gadafa and Professor Skiamo. And the idea was to force the military to, to, to allow for partisan policy. And of course, by 1999, when Obasanjo became president, it's also symbolic that the first Nigerian civilian president after a long period of military rule was a former general. And so there are some argument that perhaps we got the shell without the, 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 the real thing, you know, in terms of, you know, civilian value, values of democracy. So we left the value, actually. We have built around consolidation. Today, Nigeria is rated as one of the countries that have entered into the stage of consolidation, when we have handed power from one civilian regime to the government to another. But we've not really internalized these values. Again, if you look at, take, for example, the press freedom. Uh, in the States, there's so much uh, oppression of, bare naked oppression of, of media. People have been arrested and uh, you know, the DSS that's supposed to deal with terrorism is not dealing with considering free speech as the main threat to national development and national security. So I think that's a degeneration in terms of uh, both the quality of the institutions and their response. And of course, this all relate to the failure to internalize the values of democracy, even as we adopted the electoral process processes of democracy, the institutions, the National Assembly, all the framework, but the values that define them, even in terms of independence of the, these institutions, they don't have, we don't have them. So, so press freedom becomes, we run more like a prebender politics. We are client, patron client. You know, the politicians have hijacked the system, and those who are in you know, opposition are now being, you know, they become victim of state terror. So primarily, it's a failure of institution, it's the absence of the, effective absence of the values of democracy, and then ability to institutionalize and entrench this value. Again, poverty has also helped to uh, d destroy the capacity of people to resist. Right. So you see a pocket of resistance from maybe some civic groups, bloggers, and middle class people, but the, the most of the Nigerian population uh, as against under military rule when we had mass-based movement. We could we could have protests yeah. for like weeks and people streets are filled up. Today, of people are consumed with the question of poverty. So we, the government, the leaders have weaponized poverty and therefore has created little opposition and so it's easier to target and isolate few of those people who you can call the chattering class. All right, so all right, Dr. Samamadi. Let me, let me, to, let me. The failure to socialize these values. Thank you. From one doctor to another, we're joined now by Dr. J. Joe Okeo Dumaki, of course, who's a human rights activist. And um, just leading off from what uh, Dr. Samamadi has said, there is something I wanted to talk about, which is the issue of protest, you know, and speaking up as Nigerians. So there's a constant accusation that this generation seems to be just filled up with keypad warriors, people who don't who can't stand up or take to the streets you know, and, and, and fight for their rights. Is this, is this as a result of the fact that what uh, Dr. Samamadi has said, that poverty has been weaponized and we are made um, incapacitated by government, or are we lazy, or has government found a way of just stifling protest these days? Well, uh, flowing from what uh, Dr. Sawamadi said, my uh, good friend, there's a relative law followed by abject poverty, where our country has become the headquarters of poverty. But one thing we should also understand that during the military dictatorship, we had one common enemy where people galvanized. But now, some are into politics, people are into different uh, fields you know, of uh, endeavor. Uh, but uh, more importantly, government must ensure that that ambience of uh, peaceful protest is allowed and uh, it's allowed because you see that at times people want to come out. In, in those days, we, uh, in several years, we practice uh, pseudo-democracy, then from pseudo-democracy flow to dictatorship, uh, several years of agitation rather than enjoying democracy. So now, although we still have uh, people who are not completely cowed, we still have people who engage in protests, but I think that a lot more needs to be done. Uh, now we have come to the time that people should uh, organize less and organize more. 
And also in doing that, the government should also have enough political will. The security agencies should be more tolerant and allow people, enough people want to come out, they are scarce thief. But we still have people who have been emboldened and uh, we cannot allow the community to continue to thrive if we do not act. Poverty has been used as a strong uh, weapon uh, in uh, making people not, you know, not to see that uh, in terms of protest, it's, it's not like a hundred meters race. It's going to keep gathering momentum. I mean, if you think about military dictatorship, then that when we have protests, it's not it's not the time that you're taking selfie or help bullets and uh, maiming and killings. So now we have uh, democracy. So I just uh, want to appeal, you know, to our young ones and others that if, I mean, the transfer now says that every onlooker is either a coward or a traitor. So we cannot continue to be onlookers. We must ensure that when things go bad, we, we speak up because uh, our lives begin to end. The day becomes silent about things that matter. That's also... Is, is it is it possible that it's time to start rethinking, you know, the way we get across our message to government? There are many people who believe that, you know, protests don't yield any results. I think for a lot of people, the last time we got anything out of a protest might have maybe the enough is enough protest, which is over 10 years ago. Most people don't think that we protest. I mean, we get shot at and everybody goes back home and government still does what they need to do. I mean, technology is available. Now, are there ways we should start rethinking how we get across the government with our issues? I think that uh, the age of social media and internet has, uh, has uh, enabled, when people go out on protest, there's crackdown, but with social media, with internet, uh, people can use other means in reaching out, in carrying out protests, writing uh, petitions, and galvanizing uh, people for change, going to the National Assembly, lobbying, uh, various forms that uh, can be used. We, uh, we saw what happened in, uh, during military dictatorship and even uh, June 12. Uh, people were so persistent. So the age of uh, social media, I, I, I believe that uh, one thing is, uh, is certain, that uh, you know, when we talk about power, is we, we have to demand you know, for something before we get it. And it's not on a platter of good. Uh, so we must, there must be that uh, ambience, you know, the security. There must be a level playing ground. Uh, our people, no violence pays at all time. So I think that the social media can be used as a form of campaign in order to, uh, you know, in order to fill the gap in the physical protest that we have. Not to even talk about. The, the era of uh, COVID-19, coronavirus, where uh, gathering and all other things, we, yes. endanger, we okay. endanger other people's lives. Okay. Let me just uh, go back to Dr. Sam Amadi now and just wrap it up. I don't know. Are you, Dr. Sam, are you, are you positive? Are you feeling hopeful with the future, with our human rights record currently and where we're headed? Well, uh, in terms of records, we, are, we don't have a good record, but... In terms of uh, the consciousness that we are seeing, for example, we've seen uh, the National Human Rights Commission also coming up during this COVID, reporting very well on violations of rights and willing to, to take action. So those kind of institutional response gives hope. Again, technology has helped a lot, like she said. We, we, we know that uh, naming and shaming is easier, and that's critical for government. No matter how brutal governments are, they, they, like to, they, they don't like to, feel to, to, be, to, to be painted bad. So you have to, if you paint the ugly very dark, it makes them feel frightened. So using social media, using information to, to, to change narrative, and of course incentivize good behavior on part of government is helpful. So digital tools enable us to do more with little. Uh, well, the issue about protest, physical protest is very important because some um, violations require paralyzing the states in a way that it can really 
be forced to take decisions. Look at what's going on in the U.S. So the, in spite of uh, it's been largely peaceful, but because it has lasted too, too long and it has physical, the optics is very good. So people in public policy are now quickly they are changing their, 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 the policies to suit the outcome desired by the people. But if it was only about social media, blogging and uh, tweeting, I, I doubt if. So at a point, you need to marry two together. And I have hope that with the level of consciousness, with the organizing capacity and with how technology and science has helped us to organize, to do more with less, with Zoom and all these digital flat platform, we can organize easier. We don't need to have billions to get people together. We can create narratives. And with, with the growth of literature, growth of media, uh, narratives in terms of social issues, social journalism, I think we have hope that maybe we can internalize incentives for those in power to really do good. But the, the driver of human rights governance are persons who have human rights credential and who understand the importance of human rights to development. We just hope that our people can elect persons who have those credentials so that they will be naturally attuned to the values and the need for human rights. That's hope, but the records are dismal. That's the point. Let me find out what now from Joe uh, uh, Dumaki. Um, same question I asked, but you, we've talked about poverty and the economics and, of course, politics now. Uh, good governance is tied to poverty and, you know, a better economy. And as long as people are poor, you, you both seem to agree that people cannot necessarily come out and speak for themselves. How do we get out of this cycle? I think there must be a change of mindset, determination, and uh, with great zeal and passion with all those things put in place. Because where determination is, is failure can never dismantle the flag of success. So with determination, with all the things, I mean, the devil has a nation, poverty and the rest, but if people make up their mind, I'm an incurable optimist. I'm so optimistic that if people decide to put all these ills aside and brace up, they are hopeful, and they see that it's not only today, but the future, I'm, I'm sure that we'll, we'll get to that place where, and I keep, uh, I continuously make reference, you know, to June 12. So our people must never give up. If they learn to embrace, you know, the spirit of June 12 in our daily conduct, it will really impact on our democracy, and they will be able to brace up and speak against the ills in our society. Thank you very much, uh, Joe Keodumakin and Dr. Sam Amadi. We'll continue this conversation in the coming years. Hopefully, um, all of those rankings where we see Nigeria doing really terribly will continue to improve in the latter. Thanks for joining us. We'll take a break now and be right back. Please don't go away. All right, welcome back. We're still talking human rights uh, on the show today, and I'm being joined now here by David Houdain, um, who's a journalist. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having and me. And of course, we're joined by Indicato in Abuja. Um, but first, let me start with you, David. There's um, a new sort of uh, wave of, of protest in Nigeria, which I was talking about with the last, last couple of guests, which technology sort of drives now, mm. which is sort of a hashtag uh, <laughs> protest. Um, we, we did see a lot, a lot of that recently with the incidents of rape. Yeah. which sort of swept across the country the last couple of weeks. Uh, justice for Uwa, justice for Tina, justice for Jennifer. There were so many of this, uh, this hashtag. But there's a lot of sides to the belief that does it actually work? Um, are we doing the right thing with, with the way we're going about speaking up these days? So I think um, yes and no. It, it works, but it works only to an extent. So uh, those who say, oh, it's just social media, I don't think they really know what they're talking about. Social media is actually really powerful. And I think there have been quite a number of instances where the fact that something went viral or was pushed on social media resulted in some kind of action to resolve that thing. However, in the case of uh, directed political change or cultural change, it always has to go beyond social media. I like to point out, for example, that some of the most successful uh, sort of groups in the world, whether it's, it's uh, political groups or religious groups, they always have this habit in common that regardless of how much online engagement they do, there's always a face-to-face -face element. So for example, I was raised as a Jehovah Witness and one of, I think their most uh, popular thing that they are known for is going from door to door and knocking. In this age, they don't need to do that, but they still do that. Uh, political formations around the world, people still go from door to door with flyers because that face-to-face uh, -face personal contact can't be replicated online. Yeah. However, I think in the case of Nigeria where for a variety of reasons, that sort of direct 
face-to-face -face action. In many cases, sometimes it's risky. Sometimes it's just not desirable. So I think people do what they can. So ultimately, we will need to have that conversation about taking this thing offline. But yeah. I think for now, it's unfair to criticize those who are, who are doing some sort of advocacy online. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you think younger people are lazy? Um, it almost feels like when the military was in power, they were, we saw more activism on the streets in Nigeria. Democracy has come where there's supposed to be more free will. Mm. Um, getting people to come out and actually protest on anything, whether peacefully, seems harder these days. And a lot of people believe younger Nigerians are lazy or just want to sit down and type. Do you think that's the case? It's not necessarily a thing about laziness, in my opinion. I think it's a thing about comfort. So in, in the Abacha years, for example, well, I don't know if people came, came out protesting in the Abacha years, but in the Babangida years, maybe, when such things could still, hap could still happen. I think there was a, uh, the country was going through a very, very rough period. People were very uncomfortable in a manner that we perhaps can't even imagine right now. So I think that sort of galvanized people to go out on, onto the streets. I think these days, it might sound counterintuitive to say this, but I think these days we're actu we actually enjoy a measure of relative comfort compared to what Nigeria used to be at the time. And, and we also have a lot of distractions to keep us sort of, to keep our minds off of these things. So these, these factors combine to sort of keep us indoors because, yeah. you know, who wants to go out when you can stay indoors and play or FIFA on PS5. Yeah, put or, out a few tweets. Exactly. Let me, let's go to Abuja now, and joined by, by human rights activist uh, Ndikato. Um, the, um, there's a lot of younger people, like I say, who believe that um, a lot of things hinder uh, how we go about our activism these days. What are the challenges that you, as an individual, face uh, in this new age uh, of activism? Um, I'll pick up from some of the things that um, David has touched on and is that we get distracted very easily. So if you look at, for the past couple of weeks, we were talking about Ua's case and people would just move on. You know, in the morning, you might be talking about brutality and all of those issues. And by evening, somebody has said, should my wife cook for my mother? Or should somebody sit in the front seat? And all of that, that distraction just takes all the attention away. There's also the... I don't know how to explain what the, the exact word to use for what is happening in the media now, but it kind of like desensitizes people from what is happening. So if you're talking about killings in Nigeria, things that should trigger Nigerians to want to pay attention, to want to act, it's reduced to numbers. And um, someone pointed it out, I think it was it's the, um, the writer, El Nathan, and it's like there's a deliberate way in which you know, news is being reported that just makes people not connect to what is happening. It's reported like gossip, 15 people died, so, 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 please, 15 people gone down. There's no backstory. There's no oh, history of this thing, nothing. So some of those things, too, take our minds away or reduce the intensity of things that could keep us out on the street or keep us talking. And... Um, I think another issue I face uh, as an activist, you see, I think in Nigeria, everybody wants to be a hero. We're seeing those kind of things. So a movement comes up, you know, um, end uh, SGBV or um, state of emergency SGBV. And we'll expect that, you know, everybody throw your weight behind state of emergency SGBV. But then again, because, you know, this platform democratizes voices. So people think, oh, let them go ahead and do their own this side. We would also do here, we would also do here, it kind of like takes attention away or, you know, divides movement into smaller units instead of a big unit. And um, I think the, um, we, I, uh, either Dr. Um, Dr. Samamadi or Dr. Joe Odumakin touched on the um, poverty issue. I think people have gotten to that level of poverty. People are tired and are existing on survival. Every day you wake up as, an, as a Nigerian, you just want to survive. You want to get to the next point. You want to get to the next day successfully. And some of these things, people can't really just stop to pay attention to them. Even as an activist, I find myself in such situations some days. Like you hear something and you're like, oh, I just want to survive today. I just want to get through today. I just, you know again and all the loopholes and all the pitfalls in trying to solve these issues and how difficult every step of the way can be in trying to solve these issues so i think some of these things they contribute yeah. to making these difficult for people i know it looks like oh our generation is not doing enough or or we might be busy with other things no there's a certain level of oppression oppression you would face and see nothing happening that you know 
might push you to silence. And that is, that is another thing. But what we thank God for, what we are thankful for, is that, again, the space has been democratized. Our voices can be heard. We are louder, we're bolder. And I'll use this example. My mom did a lot of writing on the injustice of Nigeria growing um, in her time. She did a lot of writing on this um, crisis and all of those issues. You could say that she was an activist. But I, as a young person, when I started activism, when I was speaking, because of the difference in brutality and, you know, the generations, how bad they, f they faced issues under the military, you would hear even my mom, who was a bold activist and a gender, you know, warrior and all of that, would say, please just calm down, please just calm down. There's a difference between that. I think that we have been on the street so many times too. We have done so many protests that it looks like it's normal. I think that it's, it wasn't as much in the last generation, but the few that happened stood out. For us, it could be just any other day. So let, it let could me, be let me, thrice let me, in let a me, week. It could be me, how many me, times in a month. It could just happen. Sorry to cut you in there, because you mentioned a few things that I, I want to touch on. You know, first of all, you mentioned the fact that the media maybe yeah. might play a role in the fact that, you know, people get desensitized to a lot of things. Um, but on the other hand, which I mentioned with the earlier guests, yeah. you know, we've had so many cases of journalists, quote unquote, being hounded and disappearing. We don't know what's happening, but these things are happening, whether we like mm -hmm. it or not. And there's a fear for a lot of people who say, OK, I can't yeah. do my job fully as a media person because I don't know what the consequences might be. On the other hand, you also mentioned poverty being, being yeah. an issue. So and these two issues sort of are tied to, for a lot of people, government. How much of a role is government playing or should be playing in letting the space be freer for issues like this to thrive? Well. <laughs> In, in terms of talking of the role that government should play, I would say I, I think there should be another segment that will talk about the future. But let me just touch on this. What we are seeing in the past couple of months, especially with COVID-19, is everybody starting to pay attention. And it was for me at the beginning of this, I said, look, what is, what is happening right now is a seismic shift. And it could go either way. It could be that we'll end up cementing autocracy, cementing brutality, or everybody will sit down and will sit up. Everyone will sit up and decide, look, I don't know what's happening. This is, a, this is a certain level of uncertainty that we don't know what could happen. And we need to control things from further breaking down. And so in this particular setting, I've seen government stepping up. You could see the police. In the past couple of weeks, we've seen issues that, you know, we had to go to the police station to solve and everything. And you would see the police, oh, some officers want to prove stubborn, but it's like there is an order from above, like, no, this can't happen at this time. This can't be this way. This cannot be that way. And what I would say is, can this be sustained, please? Yeah. Can this be sustained? Can we have the sustenance of key government organizations that are trying or uh, their mandate is actually to pursue human rights, to ensure human rights, sustain what is happening. We have NHRC stepping up to the plate. We have NAPTIP. We're hearing a lot of these organizations. I think even Malami came out with a statement for what they are supposed to do. And so we're seeing in real time government stepping up to what it is they are supposed to do. But for me, number one is that we need this to be sustained. We need okay. this let me, to be let me, sustained. Let me, let me, let me come to David here, sorry. Beyond um, this. Sorry, sorry to cut you. Yeah. I just want to come to David now because we have very, our time isn't that much. Um, uh, something that's sort of gained traction in the last couple of years, started in America, has become a very popular phrase around the world now is fake news. And a lot of young people are accused of fueling this. You know, you go on social media, something is trending, you realize it's a lie or something made up by somebody. And um, most people believe that a lot of this government trying to control the spaces because of things like this and what it might cause. What are your thoughts on, you know, this whole talk about regulating social media and what it might do for stifling voices and, you know, becoming a human rights issue and also sort of constraining this platform you believe is a new way of protesting? Uh, first of all, I want to point out that if we, if we want to talk about fake news and distribution and dissemination of fake news, between those who do it on a social media level and those who do it in an official capacity in government, I think there's, there's serious competition between them. This government is also guilty of putting out fake news. They do so regularly. So I think it's an excuse that is being put out because they're trying to stifle freedom of the public space mm -hmm. to hold certain discussions. I, I, the, the, I think it was Dr. Joe who made the point earlier that the government doesn't necessarily want to do the right thing, but they're obsessed with being seen in a certain way. They're obsessed with looking good. And unfortunately, when people like us are having the conversations we do on social media in the very unfiltered, raw, earthy manner that we do, 
where we don't do the whole SASA thing. Every, everybody says things as they see it. The government really doesn't like that. So obviously then the next thing is to look for an excuse. And that excuse is, oh, you people are distributing fake news. But if fake news was really the problem, I don't think it's an unsolvable problem. And I, I don't think you, the only way to solve it would be to wield the ban hammer, which is you know, their preferred implement. I think, for example, how on, on, on Twitter, for example, of recent, uh, I think we've been seeing examples of how uh, peop prominent people who, uh, who uh, disseminate fake news are being tackled. I think we've, we saw the example of the US president, where Twitter actually put an addendum to his tweet that this tweet may contain yes. misleading information. So I think there are several ways of dealing with these things than simply going after the people and you know, trying to constrain the space. Because at this point in Nigeria's history, uh, I want to point out that the, the Global uh, Press Freedom Index of 2020 has Nigeria at number 115 out of about 200 countries. Yeah, so it's so not looking good. It, we are not doing well at all. And at the same time, we are, we're, we're trying to borrow legislation from countries like Singapore, which ranks at number 158 on the press freedom ranking, 43 places below us. So I think we can clearly see what direction the government is trying to head in. Yeah. And fake news is obviously the easy scapegoat. So I think that needs to be really resisted frontally. Ducato, one sentence or one word, are you hopeful? Yes, I am. Okay. Are For you now. Hopeful? David? Uh, I have to be. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, guys, for joining us. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's a conversation that needs definitely more than 15, 20, 30 minutes, but we'll continue to talk about it and hopefully continue to hold government accountable uh, for their actions. We'll take a break now and be right back. Please don't go. Away. All right, welcome back. We're joined, of course, now by Chetan Wanze, who's, uh, who used to be a regular on the show. Welcome back. And thanks for staying socially distanced. <laughs> Away. It's very interesting times. I'm talking about social yeah, distancing. Extremely interesting. COVID-19 is still, almost, some people seem to forget now that it, it still is killing people. Numbers are crazy. We have, I think, 15,600 are there about cases in Nigeria now confirmed. And um, every day we're almost even by, by 1,000 now. But we're also going through this human rights drama in the country as well. There's the rape incidents going on, police shootings happening here as well. And we're watching what's happening across the world. How are we doing? I mean, we've seen a few people come out to protest in parts of Lagos, I believe, um, and parts of Edo states. How, how do we go about, you know, still speaking up in a time when we're not allowed to gather, you believe? I think in, um, in many respects that the lockdowns have ended. Um, people are, and this is not just in Nigeria, but all over the world, people are tired of, the, the human being is a, is a social animal. You can't keep people cooped up for a long time. I mean, one lesson I have learned about this is that house arrest is a very effective way of punishing people. Um, so people will gather, especially as uh, things like police brutality come to the forefront. Um, we've had at least four incidents of... Uh, rape in religious uh, in churches um the uwa uh, the uwa incidents in benin god rest her soul we've had one in benue we've had uh, yesterday there was one reported in Oyo state um there's also been one reported in i think abuja i mean um human rights will come to will keep coming to the fore as long as we run a nation or a country where we don't have consequence too many of the people who do some of these things do those things in the belief or in the knowledge, um, depending on how you look at it, that they, that they will do it and nothing will happen. I mean, I've been, a, a policeman has pointed a gun at me before and told me, I will shoot you, nothing will happen. And he will not do that if he doesn't genuinely believe that nothing will happen. Um, now you have a situation where since the day, of, the day Nigeria declared its index case till yesterday, today is 14th bar. So yes, the data I have is accurate as of the 13th of June. Since that time, we've had, we have a case of 60, 62 people have been shot dead by the security forces during, in various guises. That's, that's major. Um, and when you have such numbers, at some point, people will finally begin to get tired yeah. and will begin to congregate, speak up. Um, I, would just, I would say that NSAS has been, um, has been on pause 
but it will, it will, it will resurrect. Yeah. That's just the harsh reality. We're going to take a very, very short break. Uh, when we come back, we'll be joined by the Secretary of the National Human Rights Commission to get his perspective on what they're doing with regards to human rights issues in Nigeria. Please don't go. We represent, hey, hey, all right, welcome back. Uh, we're talking human rights uh, and corona, coronavirus in the coronavirus era. And uh, of course, I've been joined now from Abuja, from the National Human Rights Commission, Tony Ojuku. Um, thanks for joining us, uh, sir. I want to just start basically with all of what's been going on in the last couple of weeks. We've had so many incidents of rape and, you know, I think most importantly, police brutality. We did hear about Tina, who was shot dead in Lagos. And as we heard from Cheta earlier, we've had at least 62 cases of uh, extrajudicial killings by security operatives since the COVID-19 pandemic started. I mean, these are issues that are glaring. And we, I mean, one case is what triggered the whole of the United States. Where, uh, what are your thoughts on where Nigeria is human rights wise, especially with regards to those who are supposed to keep us secure? Yeah, thank you very much, Ibuka. Um, yeah, uh, it's as if the COVID-19 pandemic um, threw up so many things. And um, human rights is also one of the victims of the COVID-19 pandemic. Because, um, of course, the, from the lockdown, is as if the security agencies just went on rampage. And you know, it was like violation galore. And uh, we said so, but um, it did not only stop there. There are things by also private actors, you know, things like rape and uh, domestic violence and sexual and gender-based violence generally was exacerbated, you know. So even some areas that uh, we did not even advert our mind to, you know, we, 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 un we underestimated the effects of uh, locking people um, in during the lockdown, you know, um, I, I kept wondering. I said, what was it that was provoking this level of uh, um, sexual and gender-based violence just because of the lockdown? And I realized that uh, the human being is really a social animal. And uh, if you put people under house arrest, under the conditions under which the lockdown was being enforced, uh, that's the consequence, is the manifestation in so many ways. <clears throat> However, it also has exposed the inadequacies of our system, that women remain unprotected, that women's rights uh, matter, and that uh, we should uh, do all we can to make sure that this doesn't continue and should never happen again. So what we are doing is we have... Um, decided uh, to make sure that we use this opportunity to create massive, massive awareness on sexual and gender-based violence. We make sure that we train all the uh, responsible agencies like the police, and uh, we are collaborating with NAPTIP and police to make sure that um, every single case of sexual and gender-based violence is going to be thoroughly investigated and prosecuted because accountability is an issue. Uh, we are also embarking on a massive campaign to make sure that uh, uh, people know what to do when they are uh, victims of sexual and gender-based violence. We are also trying to uh, create awareness so that people don't feel stigmatized, so that people don't feel um, withdrawn, because if they feel withdrawn, they will not report cases of sexual and gender-based violence, and that is why perpetrators go free. People yeah. must be able sorry, to come sorry, and sorry, speak sorry, out. Sorry, sorry and we should stop. I want, to, I want to talk specifics now. Very sorry yeah. to cut you off because I know I, I, I like that you're talking about these things. But I want to talk about legislation, which is a very important part of this conversation. Um, something that came up a lot when all of these rape cases were being talked about was age of consent in Nigeria. I mean, there's a plethora of legislation in Nigeria that ex excludes women from anything. For the longest time, women couldn't get something as simple as a, as a Nigerian passport without their husband's consent. We still have a lot of those laws that are available. What, are, what is the commission doing to, to to start making practical uh, steps to fix things like this? Well, uh, by our act, we, we have the mandate to advise uh, government on needed reforms in terms of legislation. We intervene in every legislation that comes in parliament to uh, advise them on the human rights implications, and that includes um, issues like you have raised. Of course, um, 
Uh, there are ongoing reforms. Uh, government has set up uh, a gender responsive committee which is going to look at all laws and see how these laws can be harmonized in such a way that um, uh, victims are not uh, prejudiced in, in terms of uh, getting accountability. So we are looking at all that now. And um, of course, um, we are working with other stakeholders to make sure that um, uh, the relevant laws are going to be reviewed to make sure that uh, prosecution is a little bit easier and um, uh, it is not hard on the victims of uh, sexual and gender-based violence. Let me come to you, Cheta, now. There's, he's talked a lot about, you know, what a lockdown might have done to people, uh, which could be, I mean, all over the world, we had cases of domestic violence was on the increase, not just in Nigeria. But, of course, police brutality was also a part of the situation. I mean, we've talked about NSARS for so long, and it's still a thing, you know. Are you, do you believe that with the ease on the lockdown, things will get better? Or you think it's still going to be the same? Number one, travel restrictions still exist. Um, and it, uh, a lot of the cases of police brutality, of uh, um, security forces brutality, because to be fair, it's not just the police that are guilty. A lot of the cases of security forces brutality happen on the roads. Um, because people have, the, the security forces have been extorting a lot of people who have been disobeying the law, uh, disobeying the president's edicts in, and traveling. Um, the, the, uh, it, and it goes to show just how um, rogue our security services have gone in many respects. Yeah. Um, this is not the first time that Nigeria has had um, uh, uh, orders issued to the security forces, especially the police with regards to our roads. And most times they, they practically listen to the orders, shrug and do what they want to do. Um, every Inspector General of Police since Musiliu Smith in 1999 has said that, oh, roadblocks should be taken off the roads. And every Inspector General has been disobeyed. It tells you some, yes. that something is deeply wrong in the culture of policing in the country. And that's where the problem is. The culture of policing in the country is all over the place. It needs to be looked at. Um, policing, by its very nature, ought to be a local affair. Not even states, but more local. If the policemen stay among the population they are meant to be policing, they will behave better. That's something that we ought to look at. We ought to take that metropolitan police model, uh, metropolitan police model from the UK, Thames Valley police, um, uh, Glaswegian police, those kind of very local police forces where the people stay, um, uh, the police stay among the people they are meant they to be And they can be held accountable by the people. they can be held accountable by the people. So take, yeah, I'm using the US as an example. There's a reason why the police are not as brutal to white people. The police force there is overwhelmingly whites and they stay among the white people. So they are accountable to those white people. But many times it is white policemen who are meant to police black people in neighborhoods that they don't stay in. So they are not accountable and so they become all Nigerian police-like behavior. Yeah. So that's, those are very specific things that, that, needs need to to be, be that need to be fixed. And I think that is something that can be fixed very quickly. Um, Mr. Mr. Juku, um, as I, I, specifics are very important to me, and we know the ranking is rankings are, are something that we like to tout when it works for us, but ignore when it doesn't work for us. Nigeria doesn't do very well with any index when it comes to human rights. Um, how are we looking going forward? Uh, for me, there is um, uh, well, well, there's there's room for improvement, but because um, if you look at our our history in the past, coming from military regime, there's no doubt that there has been constant progress in the area of human rights. And uh, I think things keep getting better every day. Well, thank you very much. Um, thanks especially to you and the Commission for making this program possible, the National Human Rights Commission, particularly supported um, our show today. And, uh, and I like that it's, it's given us an opportunity to speak our minds. Um, before we go very quickly, are you hopeful, Cheta? Um, I think there's a major test case that we have, and that will determine my, um, how hopeful I become. A young chap, uh, Ibrahim Idris, uh, Dadiata, disappeared over a year ago. We need to find him. If, uh, let's put it brutally. If he's dead, we need to know. If he's still alive, who, di who disappeared him, will the person be held to account? If we can sort something like that, then there's hope. Thank you very much, Etta, and thanks once again to the National Human Rights Commission for their support for Robin Minds today. Like I always say, you can follow the conversation on Twitter at Robin Minds Now. It's the handle. Use the hashtag Robin Minds when you tweet at us. I'll see you next Sunday. Come on, come on.